I was called up to my parents' room. Initially, I thought I'd done something wrong. And I was told, you know, Michael's been lost on the mountain. And in my mind, I can remember just kind of the, the wheel spinning going, well, you know, let me know when you find him type of thing. What was the point in calling me up to, well, why so serious? He was just quite an, kind of aspirational figure to me, you know, I, I loved him very much. I didn't process it as, as a kid uh, and I didn't really grieve either as a kid, you know, it was kind of brushed under the rug. I think the difficult thing for me when, when embarking on this particular journey was that I might have to come face to face with, with Mike's frozen body. I would see him potentially, you know, as he was the day that he died and he was 12 years older than me and at the time of filming I was 12 years older than him. So it's kind of like, I'm his big brother now you know, I'm coming to find you. I think the idea of recovering him or wanting him home may be 23 years in the making. But once I realized that, you know, body recovery was even a thing, I knew that we had to do something and, and look into it at least. Um, so that's when the cogs began to turn. I think the idea of recovering him or wanting him home uh, maybe 23 years in the making. Um, obviously I was 10 at the time, so a bit young for me to be having those kind of thoughts. I think body recovery is a relatively new thing on Everest. Um, it took advances in technology like, you know, helicopters being able to fly into camp two to be able to even consider recovering bodies off that mountain. In 2017, we receive a photo of a body um, on Mount Everest that looks as though it could be Michael. And obviously it's the first time as a family that we have seen who we believed you know, could be Michael in, in over 20 years. Uh, and it came with an offer to recover him, but there was very little in the way of actual hard you know, evidence that it was Mike and it all felt a bit rushed. Um, but once I realized that you know, body recovery was even a thing, because I hadn't thought about it, um, I knew that we had to do something and, and look into it at least. Um, so that's when the cogs began to turn. The journey to try and recover Michael's body though must have been a tricky task to agree to take on because there's an implicit level of danger upon yourself as well. So how did you get to a stage where the penny dropped and you thought, okay, I'm going to go ahead with this. It was, it was, it was a difficult decision to make to, to kind of head out to Everest in the first place because obviously we didn't want to put others at risk to recover Michael. You know, Michael's been, been dead for over 20 years and, and regardless of how good a climber you are, there are risks associated with climbing that mountain. Um, you know, natural disasters um, that, that can't be avoided. Um, so I guess um, what really gave us the, the confidence to move forward as a family was, was Nims, Persia. You know, he holds the, the record for, for having climbed the 14 highest peaks in the world in, in seven months, I believe. Um, the star of 14 peaks, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, and he, his physiology and, and the physiology of his team is, you know, something else. It's kind of, you know, sea level stuff for us. Um, and initially the family's stance on the recovery was that it was too risky and it was Nims who was able to uh, give us the confidence that um, this was possible and, you know, albeit not completely without risk, but, you know, we wouldn't find a better team than him and his men. And that, I think, gave us the confidence to proceed. Looking back to, you know, the late 90s when and there was a fair age gap between you and Michael, I think an, an 11 year age gap. What do you, and, you know, you were 10 years old when he passed away, you're now 34, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So what do you remember about Michael when you look back? When I got back? Uh, well, when, you, when you look back to, to those days, back. when you look back. Um, Michael and I had the kind of relationship that any close brothers would have. You know, Michael was the sibling, um, as far as I'm aware, that was really pushing for my parents to have another kid. Um, he was desperate for a younger brother or younger sister. Um, and kind of, I just felt an, an enormous sense of, of love from him. You know, my brother was a professional racing driver uh, very early in, in his life, so he was often kind of away competing. My dad would work, you know, away from home quite a lot. So my, my earliest memories of home kind of revolve around uh, Mike, you know, and my mum. And, um, you know, to, to get up into Mike's room, there was, he climbed this ladder and we'd spend all this time together and, you know, play video games together, just, you know, standard stuff. I just felt um, a sense of security with him. You know, if I ever, um, you know, just needed anything, I'd kind of go to Mike and Mike, Mike would be, 
you know, my, my kind of, Mike was my guy, you know. He'd tie up my, my other brother so that I could beat him up, you know, just all kinds of stuff. You just know, what he, brothers do, isn't it? Yeah, he, yeah. but he, he was, uh, there was always a kind of similarity between me and Mike that, um, and that's not to say that, you know, we're not a, a very close family in general, but, you know, Mike and I were described as, as twins separated by time. You know, we looked very similar. We had similar tastes. We, we liked kind of the same stuff, but also I kind of always found myself wanting to be like Mike. You know, I always envisaged myself growing up to be like Mike. Um, so he was just, um, he was just quite a kind of aspirational figure to me. You know, I, I loved him very much. And how long did it take for you to process the fact, because he was 22 years old when he embarked on uh, the, the ascent of Everest that sadly took his life. How long did it take for you, as a 10 year old boy, something very difficult to process at that age. How, when do you think you, you were able to fully process what had happened to him? Um, I, well, you're right, I didn't process it as, as a kid. Uh, and I didn't really grieve either as a kid. You know, it was kind of brushed under the rug. Um, part of me is quite happy, you know, that I was the age that I was because I had these almost juvenile feelings about death. You know, it's certainly something that I didn't understand. And, and Michael, to me, was this force of nature who was the fastest, the strongest, the best, you know, just things that you would think about your older brother naturally. Um, and to me, it was impossible that he'd lost his life, you know, climbing a mountain. I had no clue what Everest was, right? I knew that it was the biggest mountain in the world, but to me that w was meaningless, you know, when thinking about Mike. Um, I remember the day that I was told when he um, had been killed and it wasn't described like that to me. I, you know, I was called up to my parents' room and initially I thought I'd done something wrong because, uh, you know, it sounded very serious, you know, and I'd come up to our, our room, you know, and I, was, I thought, Christ, you know, what, what's, what's been going on? So I went up and, um, and I was told, you know, Michael's been lost on the mountain. You know, we don't know where he is. Um, and in my mind, I can remember just kind of the, the wheel spinning going, well, you know, let me know when you find him type thing. What was the point in calling me up to, well, why so serious, you know? And, um, and my life just, just carried on, you know, and I was kind of sheltered from it almost. Obviously, you wouldn't be including a 10 year old in the conversations around his memorial service and him, you know, so, so for me, it was a process that never hit me like a train you know, like it did the rest of my family. And for that, I guess I'm, I'm grateful. I, w I wanted to ask you about that because I th de men don't deal with extreme emotions that well. Um, I remember when my grandfather passed away and it was the first time I'd ever seen my dad cry. And I was 16 at the time. So that's the first 16 of my years of my life that I'd never seen my dad display any real extreme emotion and it looked really it just puzzled me really and it just and looking back to that makes me think that men don't deal with grief that well and I, I, I suppose in your case correct me if I'm wrong but being a young lad at the age of 10 that was probably exacerbated even further by the fact that when did you ever get the chance to fully grieve Michael's passing we never I never did really you know uh, and I think it's an age thing. I'm, you know, my, my family certainly cried and, and mourned him. Um, but as I said, you know, for me it was just, um, you know, a strange age to be doing that. You know, a part of me in the back of my mind thought I'd see him again. Part of me thought that he'd reappear in a couple of years, you know, and surprise everyone. You know, so I never fully understood that I wasn't going to see him again until, of course, years passed and, you know, people don't survive the night on Everest, let alone, you know, years. And tell us about the physical and emotional toll that the journey took on, on you. It's quite, it's, quite a long, uh, it's quite a long process, you know, uh, particularly once you throw in the searches um, on Everest. So getting to base camp alone is an eight day walk, right? And that's, um, you could probably do it quicker if you really wanted to, but it's all about acclimatizing and, and slowly moving through um, the altitude barriers um, so that by the time you get to base camp you can live and exist there without um, you know feeling under too much duress and it's um, it's one of the most beautiful you know treks walks hikes whatever you want to call it um, surely in the in the world you know not that I'm a, an experienced hiker but it's uh, you know it was fantastic it was really really beautiful you kind of feel like you're in some National Geographic movie um, one of the best bits was 
uh, this little town called Namche Bazaar. You're at about 15,000 feet, I believe, at this stage, so you know, you're, you're pretty high. Um, and you, you round this corner and you're in this town and there are kids going to school, there's like a bakery, there's a coffee shop, there's a pizzeria, and there's kind of like people walking their dogs and it's like, you, you kind of, you can't quite believe that there's this little civilization up in the clouds. There's no roads, so there's no motor vehicles of any kind, um, no bicycles even, because you wouldn't be able to, to bike in. So you're walking in and out of this place and it's like tens of kilometers, you know, maybe 50 kilometers from the next, you know, bit of civilization. And you just think like, it's amazing that these places even exist. And it's just through that town that I got my first glimpse of Everest. Um, and the whole thing just felt so powerful, right? I just felt like it's the closest I've ever been to Mike, you know, since I was 10. Um, I just felt really reassured that what we were doing was really special and worthwhile. Um, and, you know, I just, the, the whole thing was, was great. You know, as far as preparing physically, um, you know, I've been sober for four and a half years. Um, I, I believe very much in, in training and keeping physically fit. So, you know, as far as having to train physically, I, you know, I, I, I didn't really have any specific training routine to get myself in shape really for, for this. You know, the bigger question mark was around altitude, right? You hear of really fit people, athletes even, that, you know, you whack them at altitude and they can't function properly. That was a question mark. I went to the altitude center actually, um, and they, they slapped this mask on you and they put you at like, you know, all kinds of different um, altitudes. And, you know, one of them is, is base camp level and they have you cycle, you know, not that you're gonna be cycling at base camp, but, you know, just to give you an impression of what happens when you put yourself through physical strain at altitude. And you, you suffocate within seconds. Like you physically can't breathe at all. Um, and it's just a gentle reminder that, you know, don't go running around base camp, you know, because you will, you, you will struggle with that. So, you know, altitude was, was, was a bigger question mark than, than anything else, but it was fine, you know. You take, take it easy, listen to your body. If you need to slow down, slow down. If you need to sit down, sit down. You know, that's about it. Did you meet anyone along the way who was able to, to kind of help guide you in, in your pursuit and, and both kind of physically and kind of emotionally yourself, yourself kind of, you're pro you might not be the, the first person to have embarked on a journey like this. So was, was there anyone that was able to kind of have that sort of impact on you that was helped to guide you in that way? I think the difficult thing for me when, when embarking on this particular journey was that I might have to come face to face with, with Mike's frozen body, you know, and some bodies on Everest are, are very well preserved. So I would see him potentially you know, as he was the day that he died. And he was 12 years older than me. And at the time of filming, I was 12 years older than him. So it's kind of like, I'm his big brother now. You know, I'm coming to find you. Uh, and, you know, it would have been the first time of me seeing my big brother essentially as my little brother, um, which I think would have been quite strange. And I'm not sure that many people, if anyone has ever had that experience. Um, so I was kind of thinking about that and, and, and what that might do to me. Um, you know, as I touched on earlier, I'm a pretty, pretty solid thing. You know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't overly concerned, but like the closer we got to the mountain, the more I felt like, you know, that's going to be quite an experience. Um, and I don't know, I couldn't quite tell if I was, um, worried or excited. You know, it was a strange feeling that, and, uh, you know, as far as talking to somebody about you know, preparing myself emotionally. I wasn't entirely sure how that could help in the time that I had. Um, having said that, I did have, I had a, a therapy session before going out and it was uh, great. We spoke for about three and a half hours. Um, I don't have regular therapy, um, but I found it really interesting. And he, you know, he said it was very clear to him that I've been suppressing all this emotion for a while. He um, was very much of the opinion that, you know, my um, abusing alcohol throughout my, you know, teens and, and 20s was almost certainly related to not processing the grief, um, which is something that's always made me quite uncomfortable. Um, I've never wanted to associate Mike's death with my alcoholism um, because I've always just wanted to 
own that and take that on the chin, you know, as being, you know, I decided to drink to excess, you know, I drank to excess, I partied too much and, you know, that was just me and I've sacked that in now. You know, I, I using Michael's death as an excuse for that is something that I'll never be all right with. Um, so I haven't in the past. But having said that, I think it would be interesting to explore that. But I'm not one of these people who thinks that you need a pinpoint answer for everything that's happened to you in your life. You know, I think life is a fluid thing and you need to just let it, let it unravel, you know? There's no black and white and everything that we do as people is, is affected by a multitude of social, economic, environmental factors. And it could be that, you, you know, your decision to, I say decision, but your experience and battle with alcohol issues probably was in part at least affected by that. What do you hope people learn from Michael's story? Uh, you know, you, you mentioned he's kind of goes under the radar a little bit and in terms of what he achieved as a climber, it's, it's surprising that he doesn't have more of a longer lasting impact. So what, what do you hope people remember about him and his legacy? I don't know. It's, what it's, what it's, can it's, they learn it's, from him in that regard? Um, well, I suppose you can't say that anything is possible because he lost his life on, on the mountain. But, you know, as, as mentioned, you know, I, I wish that the expedition had been properly organised because uh, then perhaps he would have a legacy and, you know, you could be talking to him instead. Um, but, you know, I was asked yesterday whether or not I would advise young people not to climb Everest. And I think quite the opposite, you know, not that young people should go and climb Everest, but that people should go after their dreams and ambitions. I think, you know, trying to put a cap on what people want to achieve, um, it, it, it would be a real shame. And I think actually that when people watch the film, um, they're gonna learn quite a lot about the mountain and um, in many ways become attracted to the mountain, I think. You know, it's an incredible place and who knows, more people might climb Everest as, as a result of it. And I'm not sure that was, you know, what we were, looking for but you know it is worth saying that the mountain is, is far more commercialized now you know climbing Everest is um, despite being different uh, being difficult sorry is a much more accessible thing um, to to young climbers and people who are looking to, to to climb mountains but I think you know Michael always chased his dreams right and I think hopefully that is a, that is a good message um, for people you know who are considering not doing so. <laughs> uh, the issues of brotherly love and grief are all wrapped up and related to mental health as well. Um, in general, and you've touched on this already uh, at many points, men find it difficult to articulate and express their emotions. In general, why do you think that is? Uh, I, I, when I went for this therapy session, I arrived kind of with bells on and you know, happy as Larry type thing and sat down and the guy said, how are you feeling today? And I said, fine. And he said, fine's not a feeling. And I said, great. You know, and he was just like, well, great, it's not a feeling. And honest, honestly, I didn't know what he meant, right? Because like, I've never answered that question any differently to kind of, yeah, I feel great, you know, <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, even if I'm not feeling great, I'll say, yeah, you know, I feel good. You know, I'm not, I'm, I've never been somebody that, that whinges, you know, about anything really. And it's kind of, him trying to explain to me that there are certain feelings and you feel a certain way. I, I, I literally felt void of that. I, I, I said, I, I don't get what you're saying. He was like, how are you feeling? And I was like, I feel confused now. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, I, I, and kind of like, I just couldn't, I, I didn't understand it. And he was like, if you wanted to, we could really work on feeling and how you feel you know, and just in general, right? And like, it, wouldn't it be nice to feel things? And I was like, well, I kind of, I, I do feel things, you know, I feel love for my kids, I feel, you know, happy with my life. And he was like, how do you feel about Michael? And I just said, you know, at the time I was angry, right? And, and he said, great, let's work on that. And it's just, for me in particular, and I, 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 I can't speak for, for other men, but glad to hear that I'm not alone. Um, you know, I just think that it's, um, I don't know why it's difficult. I think, you know, we grew up, well, I certainly grew up with, um, you know, feelings that real men don't cry, you know, and to be a real man, you know, you can't show weakness. 
And that's just how it was. Like if I fell off a ladder when I was a kid, like my dad would ask me if I dented the ground, you know, like, like, but not in like a horrible way. <laughs> I'd cry and he'd say, stop crying. He's like, is the ground all right? You know, you haven't dented the ground, have you? And it, and it sounds horrible, but it wasn't horrible. It was kind of, you know, endearing, I suppose. And he was, he was always a great father, but like crying was wrong. Weakness was weak. You know, crying's not gonna help you, you know. Um, and I kind of like, just grew up with that mentality. And I suppose now when, you know, I've got, when, when people talk to me about issues they're facing or problems they're facing, I'm probably not the right person for that because I'm just, I, I don't really know how to um, even acknowledge that, that those problems are real, I suppose. I'm, I'm, I'm quite a bit of a closed book to, to emotion. And I suppose I'd like to be more emotional, but I'm, not, I'm just not quite sure how to achieve that. Finding Michael is out tomorrow friday the 4th of march if i'm not mistaken where can friday the 3rd of march, 3rd of march. Um, i believe where, where can people watch it disney plus um so if you haven't got disney plus subscribe uh if possible no you know my my hope is that people connect with the film in some way i think if you have kids if you you know if you're if you're a parent or you have brothers or sisters i think you know this film um may move you i think the team that made it are just phenomenal. Tom Beard, the director, is just a, a hero. Um, Rob and Andy on, you know, camera and sounds, um, and, and of course, um, you know, Shine and, and, and the Natural Studios. Um, I mean, what a, what a combo, right? I think when we realized that we had this team, we, we thought that there was a really good chance we might deliver something really special. And, um, you know, hope, hope you love it. I mean, I checked out the trailers. I can't wait to watch it. It looks fantastic and hopefully, it has uh, that sort of impression on everyone who watches it as well. I um, really appreciate you opening up to us. I know aspects of it might have been a bit difficult at times, so very grateful for your time. Thank you, brother. Cheers, Cheers mate. Spencer. Thank you, man. Cheers.